So in this problem, we're going to look at given given two substrates, how do you know which one's going to react by which mechanism or which one reacts faster? So if you are given, say, propyl bromide or 2-bromo-2-methylpropane, say the, que the, the question asked you, which one's going to react faster by SN2? What would your what would your guess be or your choice? So the one on the left, propyl bromide. So why would you choose propyl bromide? Because it's um, primary. So it's a it's it's a primary leaving group, and the other one is what classification? Tertiary. It's tertiary. So right off the bat, that's the first thing you want to do is classify because that that's going to help you dictate what reaction mechanism this goes by, SN1 or SN2. So just going to plug in the electron pairs here. That's something we can do from just straight electronegativity from periodic table. So in an SN2 uh, fashion, the, the primary is going to react faster. So let's, let's look at an example. What would that look like? Say you're taking this substrate. So propyl bromide. And we're going to treat that with um, say we're going to use sodium thiolate as the nucleophile. And our solvent that we're going to run this in is dimethyl sulfoxide. So if you were given just this, and then the choices were what would the product be? You know, you've already classified it's a primary halide. You have a strong nucleophile, it's bearing a charge. And then you have a polar aprotic solvent, so that's good for SN2. So the reason why it's important to draw in this delta plus, delta minus, is that you have to match the polarity. Sulfur is right below oxygen, so when it's negatively charged, it has three lone pairs. The negative charge is going to be attracted to the positive charge. You're going to form a carbon-sulfur bond, and then this bond leaves. So that would be the, the arrow-pushing mechanism. The transition state of that. So I'm going I'm to draw this in a, a specific way uh, so that you can kind of see how carbon is able to accommodate five um, substituents. So this is the transition state, and what I'm showing you now is, is the relationship between the nucleophile attacking the antibonding orbital. So here, here's your, your bonding carbon bromine. The antibonding orbital is 180 degrees, so the, the sigma star antibonding orbital is 180 degrees from that. Uh, sigma bond orbital, so that's why the nucleophile has to attack in that trajectory. And what happens is that carbon is inverted. Even though we're starting with an achiral molecule, the inversion still takes place. So that the dagger in the brackets means transition state. And then what we're ending up with is the new um, Carbon sulfur bond. So w overall, we've taken propyl bromide and we've made propane thiol. And so a thiol is just like an alcohol. Sulfur is right right below oxygen in the periodic table. 
The other inorganic byproduct of this is sodium bromide. Yeah. Um, whenever these um, reactions are happening, um, the dissolvent, they don't participate necessarily within the reaction, do they? They Cor just kind of like stay intact. Correct. So the, the question was, what, what is this, 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 does the solvent participate into the reaction? So as you notice, you don't incorporate any elements of the solvent into the product. So the solvent really is there to make everything miscible. And things have to be in the liquid state for collisions to happen. So it's, it's two solids are not going to react. They, they have to be miscible so that as we understand it, the nucleophile can get access to that antibonding orbital. So let me, um, on, on this slide here, just run through the reaction coordinate so that you're familiar with the, the points along that time frame. So our, our y-axis here is energy. Our x-axis is the reaction coordinate or time. So we're starting at, at an energy of the propyl bromide. And then the nucleophile is attacking that. So in an SN2 reaction, you're going up to some energy maximum, and that's the transition state. I'm going to extend out this dotted line. So I'm going to put in this delta G dagger and that's the, the, the free energy of activation. So that is the energy that dictates the rate. And so this is the, the TS which I've drawn above. And so for, for these purposes here I'm just going to draw the overall energy going to the product is, is less than what we started from. And now that's delta G0. So here's, here's that word again, exergonic, and that's what I mean by that term being associated with the G term. Exothermic and endothermic are associated with the H term in these thermodynamic calculations. If this energy was, was above what we started with, then the term would be endergonic, meaning that you have to, su you have to supply more energy rather than energy be being given off.